Hello world, this is Ms. Pearl from MMOBuff.tv and I'm delighted today to be able to say that I'm sitting here with Jeremy Gaffney. Hello, Hello. Jeremy. How's it going? Oh, it's a, a busy show but a fun show and I believe you've been pretty uh, run off your feet as well. Yeah, I'd say pretty much. We're towards the end of the show but it's a good show so far for us so uh, we're having a good time. Fabulous. Um, perhaps you could start by telling us uh, a little about what you do day to day in your role in the organization. Sure. I'm executive producer, which means I do very little, uh, if humanly possible, but I try to take credit for as much as possible that happens in the studio. Um, my, and all of the employees there, I think, strongly support me in this endeavor. Um, you've got a number of bits of new content out on the show floor. Um, certainly there's a lot of people following the game very closely. Um, so I'd like to try and pick up uh, really content for those people that are already familiar with the game and move it on a few steps from there. Oh, good uh, deal. To start with, um, I believe we have the two new races on the show floor. Perhaps give me your thoughts on those. Yes, there's a, quite a division, I think, between people who love our new newly announced uh, Chua, the... So, psychopathic hamsters, or as I, someone who had, was not familiar with Wildstar is walking behind him as they're walking in, and they saw the, uh, the advertisement for it, and they're like, it seems to be some kind of a game about steampunk squirrels. I'm like, well, actually, we hadn't considered that, but that seems the reasonable direction. And, of course, the Mordesh, the elvish uh, style race who has created a zombie apocalypse amongst, amongst them, and they're cursed, and some go mad, and some do not. And so uh, fans seem to be pretty evenly split about which one, which one they love. So the, that's, that's been good. That's been quite a fun announcement for us. And I believe there's two areas of content available on the floor, um, the first of which is some early 30s White Veil PvP, mm -hmm. um, and I believe also Crimson Isle, the starter zone. Yeah, that's exactly right. And the and both seem as I've been down there, it seems like there's a lot of people beating the crap out of each other in PvP, which is fun because the uh, you know it's always a blast. And the way that we do telegraphs and all that really make for some interesting gameplay with that as well. The um, and then also a lot of people are just like, no, I want to know the newbie stuff. Show me what show me what goes on here. And so that has a lot of people playing it as well. We actually have a secret mode enabled, which we're going to do on the show floor, and we're like, eh, it was too tough to organize, um, which is you, people can actually get in and play Storm Talon. And so what we'll do tonight at the party is we're going to run around and see if we can set that up so you can actually get some dungeon groups going as well and have people actually play through what we've been showing sort of on the monitors and screens and video form. Ah, we'll have go people play for real. That should be quite fun. I'm sure there's a, a ton of people who will be really happy to see that content emerge. Uh, let's just touch on another topic then. You've had a, a couple of interesting videos on the show floor. Um, one in particular had a couple of segments that have just hit a couple of the fan sites. Uh, and I believe the word I'm looking for is datascape. Ah, yes, the datascape. So we're trying to do some interesting stuff with raids. And we, we try not to talk about stuff or hype it up too much until it's fun. Um, and datascape in particular, that's a 40-person 40, 40 raid. Um, and it's rounding the corner right now into... Uh, Personally, I'm finding it actually pretty fun. And so we're going to talk more and more about raids coming up, I think, because the um, they have turned from being in development, started now being in test. And once we get beta feedback on them in particular, that's when we really like to go nuts with it. So Datascape's like in the mind of a mad computer. And we do all sorts of cool stuff. There's a lot of different rooms and wings and things. And we randomly sort each week which ones are available and then what the environmental hazards are within it and then the sub-bosses within it. And then, you know, everything we can juggle, we do. And with the goal of... Each week, you get a new configuration. You can't just go to you know the website and go, oh, okay, here's the synchronized swimming dance that we have to do to get through the raid. No, you got to actually, God forbid, think about it. And then, even if you can crack the raid, now can you be the best in the world at it? Can you do it faster than anyone else? Not first, usually, on a weekly basis. I mean, you know, wake up at 4 a.m. when the server reboots or whatever. Um, but what's interesting is how skillfully can you get your way through the raid? And hopefully, you know, what this means is now raid competitions are up to be, can you be the world best? And if so, awesome. We'll tie all sorts of fat loot, basically, to being able to be the best in the world. So you don't just get bragging rights, you also get stuff for it. Uh, you can imagine, then, to extrapolate that and take it maybe forward a couple of steps, um, the information has to exist to say who achieved which particular target mm -hmm. in a certain way. Yes. Um, might we see that information start to spill out onto various websites, perhaps APIs, perhaps tools for the community to use and engage all of this content? Yeah, I think that, that, I think it's a fairly accurate assessment. The um, What we... We're mucking right now with dungeon rewards in terms of and um, and group challenges and all sorts of ways of like how can we do interesting competitions and uh, challenges within the game and some of that 
we're really basing on player feedback too about what people want to see and how they see it and when people do interesting things in the game we like to uh, memorialize it or immortalize it and uh, by adding that kind of thing uh, into the game on a permanent basis for oh this was a cool achievement now because this group did this great thing and pulled off this great trick so um, so I think we'll probably see more of that to come that touches on one side of the Elder Game equation. Mm. Um, of course, there's another side of which um, there's a lot of speculation, but not much information out there yet. Is there perhaps a, a teaser you could share to do with Warplots? Sure. Um, so I was just doing a Warplot match the other day, um, and I was quite surprised because uh, Storm Talon, the, um, the head of the uh, uh, one of the dungeons we've been showing, came out and started kicking butt and taking names inside of that uh, Warplot match. We're putting in things where either rare drops or if you do special challenges on raid bosses or veteran dungeon bosses, um, you can actually capture them and then use them in PvP to go attack the enemy fortress. Um, the And we do have a special version of them, so it, you know the combat's balanced to be appropriate for the sort of 40v40 fight. Um, the And then give the players some ways to control them to be able to sort of sick them out and go start causing havoc. Um, and it's pretty damn cool. Um, the It's quite fun, actually. I might add too, by the way, that um, we're hearing various videos over the wall here, and I wish my life were narrated by Steve, by uh, Mr. Frost. You know, I think if there was a little dev secret coming, Jeremy is now walking up to the door. He's going into the building. Someday, perhaps. Someday. I mean, we just have to wait to hear uh, Frosty's dulcet tones from time to time. Yes. If I put on um, a guild hat for a moment and I think about the concept of a group of raiders running sure. around. Uh, and being able to provide a benefit for the PvPers yeah. within a guild or a war party. I might imagine perhaps there should be something going back in the other direction. Might mm -hmm. that be a two-way street? Yeah, and so what we're trying to do is this. Um, we like when the Elder Games kind of cross paths, and so what we envision is, is when you have a very large guild, then there's probably a breakdown. A certain number of them tend to be largely soloers, you know, uh, not in uh, large guilds, but just generically across the player base. About 60, 65 percent of people in Western market tend to largely solo. Um, and then there's a healthy crossover of the remainder between people who do PVE and uh, group PVE or PVP. And we like crossover between these, these things. And so what we're trying to do is make it so that the reward sinks and faucets kind of cross paths between these in as friendly a fashion as possible so that in the normal raid breakdown, you know, some people are just going to want to focus on PvP and that's fine, or just on PvE and that's fine. Um, but to get the best of the best stuff, you probably need some crafters around to take all these materials that are coming out of these things to craft the best gear. The, um, sometimes there's a crossover of, you know, uh, some particularly good PvP gear that comes from a PvE raid and vice versa. Um, we try to not do that all over the place because it's a pain in your ass. You know, we want you know, obviously have a good PvP or you're going to earn most of the stuff through PvP. But a little bit of crossover we think is healthy. And so, um, and making sure that all those folks who are out there largely soloing are either being able to get the materials and the extra things to pour those resources back into the other aspects of Elder Games to us is a strong and it's a powerful thing. And so um, that's the balance we're aiming for. One of the main things we need to do in the beta is A, you know, we have a really big update set of updates coming up in October where we've gotten the feedback from the first three rounds of CBT and now it's time to sort of make the changes based on this feedback, on the data that we've gotten and all that. So that'll be a big deal. And then secondly, um, what we want, what we need to do is get all the Elder Game content in so we can have multiple, multiple rounds of testing on it, multiple deployments where we improve that and make it better and better. That touches, uh, I guess, on the topic of beta. Uh, mm. Aside from the clamoring hordes knocking on the door saying, can we please come and play your game? Um, I believe it's been put out uh, to say that things are now perhaps in a pause. One of the questions in the community is, when might that pause end? Uh, that pause is likely to end in October, but... You know, we cheat. It, things are ready when they're ready. You know, and so the. Um, uh, but what we wanted to do is basically, there's a series of changes which are too large to make while maintaining the beta because we're going to break the data in between. And so, if I can give an honest answer on this, and so that's things like um, itemization. Items are kind of fun right now, and we like them. But we have some fan feedback, and we have some internal ideas on how to sort of ramp that up next level. But reitemizing the game takes longer than you know. We try to do about four or five week deployments takes longer than that to do the new system and fully itemize all that stuff. 
And so that's likely to pop up in October is with uh, itemization changes, the stuff that Donatelli's talked about um, uh, when he's done his sort of state of the beta posts, um, responding to feedback, a whole bunch of polish elements. We want to get uh, final UIs in the game. You know, if you played the game at all, you know, you're not talking about it on the forums, of course. But if you were, the, um, you know, a lot of our uh, UIs are placeholder. And so it's kind of time to get all those in so we can get final polish and final iteration going on all those systems. We really believe in tuning, tuning, tuning. And also, it's we have so many subsystems systems, all those need to flow together nicely. You know, when we track the data, we find that there's whole subsystems, whole areas of zones where people never even really bump into them, or 10% of people might find it. Um, and so we don't want to smack everyone in the face with a shovel to lead them down the path, but we do want to make sure that, you know, the info's there if you know it about, hey, two new battlegrounds just unlocked for you. You can go try them out now, and here's how to click on it. So lots of those changes can be flowing in October, and then, you know, beta deployments after that, November, December time frame. Um, we have a lot of stuff scheduled in to do that. The, um, but feedback's been really strong and really positive, and where it's not, yeah, we listen, and so we do a lot of tuning based on it. How often do you have to look at feedback and take the opinion from feedback and compare it to the actual stats that you guys are collecting behind the scenes? I would imagine that there's perhaps a divergence between opinion and reality. How yeah. do you juggle that gap? So often it actually pairs up the way you'd kind of expect, but maybe 20% of the time there's like a, and sometimes quite a divisive gap between what people say and then what their characters do. And so we take it all with a grain of salt, because, and you need to, and you need to fit personal judgment in there as well. You can't just naively say, oh, hey, there's a poll on the forums and everybody wants this and so we got to do it. No, you actually need to sometimes, you know, take a stand for where your vision is as well. But if you do that wrong, you, then you're a jerk and you know, everyone's like, your game stinks about this. And you're like, no, my vision is this. You must play the game in my way. Um, but if you don't do that often enough, then you're at the whim of the changing, you know, mood of um, what goes on in the game. You, need, you really need to balance those two aspects. And it's actually quite hard. I think one of the challenges in game design is when do you learn which of those to f sort of follow. And so where you see those large, where you see those discontinuities are um, often things like where people don't really know what the issue is. Um, it's very hard when something's meh, when someone's like, oh, it's not bad, but it's not great, it's very hard to put your finger on what causes that. But data can lead you to it. If you do, hey, here's spoiler alerts for other people out in MMO development if they don't know this. Um, you can get a lot of really interesting stuff by just tracking, hey, if someone's not played your game for two weeks, where are they? Where is their character physically? Well, you know what? They're standing around the worst content in the game. Um, because that's the thing that drove them out. They got to level 18 and then, oh, quests got too thin, or the monsters got too hard, or there was one particular public event that just slew people by the dozens and was frustrating and people tried it 20 times. It doesn't tell you what was busted, but tells you where it was busted and that helps. Or maybe at level 18 across the world, there's corpses scattered everywhere, people are like, meh. Well, that probably means your level progression is off, or it means your skill progression is off, or maybe it turns out it's only the spell slingers that this happened to. And so that data is actually very valuable to find out exactly what the heck happened. And it's actually surprisingly rare in our industry that um, not a lot of groups end up being based on data. We should be doing more of it than we actually are, actually. We, we depend a lot on uh, forum feedback. We depend a lot on surveys. Um, but the more we can back that up with data, the better off we are. Uh, one idea I think you've talked about in the past is the idea of using the leveling process as a, a training guide to the game. Yep. So the introduction, say, of different telegraphs, of different skills, of different facets of gameplay uh, is very, very granular in, in, and introduced piece by piece. Mm -hmm. um, how well are you finding that you're able to adjust this introduction and pacing of, of content as you develop and deploy more and more of the game? Well, what we try to do is... Um, there's a fine line you have to hit. Most tutorials, for instance, in games suck. You know, it takes a really good one, like Borderlands did a pretty good tutorial where, okay, you move and then you follow Claptrap around and all that kind of stuff. That was good because there was gameplay in there and it wasn't just lead you by the hand or wasn't like, okay, I know how to use WASD, for God's sake, please let me on to the next thing. Um, you don't want to be in a tutorial, you want to be playing the damn game. And so there's so many experienced gamers out there that anytime you can not have a tutorial because your UI is explaining itself or the, because the game system is obvious, the better off you are. And so we try to have a, you know, one of the zones that will be coming online soon is the arc ship zone where you, you're on this ship arriving to the planet and you're figuring out all these different uh, ways of combat and things like this. Um, that has to be an adventure. It hasn't. It shouldn't be something that you want to like. Okay, 
I want to skip through this. I've been through it 50 times before. So we try to juggle those kind of things. Um, the other trick that we use is we very often bring people into this studio, we put them under NDA, we sit them in front of video cameras, and we watch them play. And that is freaking fascinating, watching people either not find the UI that you think is so obvious because you put it in. Well, uh, no. they spend, You watch them hunting for five minutes, and you're, you're sitting there in the conference room watching her play in the other room. You're like, no, click the button. Click. That's right by your mouse. And they don't do it. It's... It's, uh, it's sad and it's maddening, and then you go and you change your damn interface and make it better. We had a thing where um, at uh, one of the ARC ships, we brought someone in, and he was doing a jumping challenge in the first zone. Um, in uh, Northern Wilds, there's a little globe that runs off. You have to bounce up. And he made the little globe appear, and he ran after it, and he jumped, and he, like, missed. We're like, oh, there's two of us maybe watching him on the screen. And then he tries it again, and he gets the first one, and he misses the second one. Like, oh! And now a couple other devs start coming in. And then by the time he made it, he made it on his 30-second attempt. And by the time he did, there were literally 40 devs in the room cheering when he got each jump. And he missed last one. Like, no! And the proctor, the guy managing the test, had to come in and tell us to shut the hell up. Because even though we were on the other side of the building, the guy was getting nervous because he's hearing us screaming and yelling every time he made a successful jump. And crying whenever he missed one. It was making him so nervous he started missing more. But that's the kind of stuff where you're like, okay, we better tune that damn jumping puzzle. The, um, and you can only really get that through watching players play. It's, it's actually tough to pull that out of the data specifically. Okay. One thing I'd love to touch on, if you still have the time, is a few community questions we've had in via sure. Twitter. Uh, so let me take a look and see what we have. Do I have to answer in less than 153 characters? or? Um, no, no, we actually prefer you to answer with more characters. Uh, okay. It tends to be more insightful. Uh, so let's start. Uh, we have a question from Anna Rez. What game had or has uh, included your favorite or most memorable quest line? And why is it your favorite? A memorable quest? Memorable quest or quest line? Ah, man, that's an excellent question. Um, I'll tell you one that's an old, subtle one, because it wasn't really quest, but it's the way that they um, uh, did it. It was original XCOM. And the reason why I say this is because they, what they did is, rather than forcing a story down your throat, you found stuff. You would pull, uh, a particular flying saucer come by. You hunt it down. There's a room in it where there's a strange cattle mutilation happening. And now, as you study this and research, all of a sudden you learn why the aliens are, are mutilating cattle. That's actually really cool because they didn't stick the story down your throat. But, man, if you're interested in it, there is depth there for you. And so that kind of taught me a few things, one of which was about the power of having a world where um, it's not just static, where these different UFOs are flying around, and each one has a purpose. They don't tell you the purpose. This one's a scout, and this one's a cattle thing, and this one's a terror ship, and the value of that kind of content. Sid Meier did that well in uh, Pirates, for instance. You know, he did a similar kind of system. Oh, this is a payroll ship. That's very clever game design, and it told a story, and it made it, at the same time as it made the world feel aligned. Um, I think a couple of the epic quest lines in WoW are really good. You know, I liked the Anixia quest line and all that. Interesting reveals, interesting story, interesting actions to do along the way. That was cool to me. The, um, uh, any of those things that span multiple zones, too, and do that, you know, that, there's powerful stuff there when that's done right. Done wrong, eh, I can name other quest lines that may be not so, so, so successful. But uh, uh, excellent question. Never been asked that before. I'm going to pick up on a, a question from Jarnod. Hmm. Uh, you mentioned uh, Sid Meier, and another quote of his in the past, and this will be a rough paraphrase, is when you make a change to a game mechanic to something new and shiny, mm -hmm. you also lose something at the same time. Yep. Um, if we look at the patch notes that have been out uh, more recently, um, there's been the discussion around semi-open tagging and streamlining. Mm -hmm. um, when do you think enough streamlining is enough, and sure. how do you go through that journey? So... Hold on, a giant German woman is attacking us now, so... Clearly a raid boss. <laughs> Thank you, Fraulein. So, um, yeah, I'll give other examples of that. There's some babies that get thrown out in the streamlining bathwater with, for instance, um, uh, do you travel to a dungeon to unlock it or not? Um, it's kind of cool to have the exploration of doing it, but it, Dungeon Finder trivializes that, and... Sometimes it's a, it removes some pain in the butt of wandering around and going LFG, LFG, but also you know, it's, it loses some immersion and the world feels smaller. Um, and so I think there's been a common case, and I've talked to my guys. When we brought on junior designers, one of the things I'll tell them about is it's very dangerous to compare to yourself to the state of MMOs today because let's take World of Warcraft as, as an example many people know. 
I think it was very appropriate in World of Warcraft launch that they had big ass dungeons and big wandering areas and you know you got black rock depths and there's 48 different objectives within it and long quest lines and complex and you had to go find a group and all that good stuff the um, it made a lot of sense at the time because it was interesting content it was teaching lore um, and there weren't infinite dungeons to go to to go level up there was only a few and so they needed to be big and cool and neat the um, but I think it's also appropriate that over time they added in three room dungeons with just you know trash mobs spread along the way. Um, they did that because uh, you know people are getting lost in the big dungeons or no one ever wanted to do the alternate objectives, and so I think that made design sense at the time. But I think you would be a little foolish if we're going to launch a game today and it's all three room dungeons with stretches of trash, even though it makes total sense in World of Warcraft today. Um, that is. Uh, you're missing the point if you're trying to keep up with the current state of a game that's eight years old and has billions of hours of content and all that kind of stuff. You've got to go carve your own niche in that. And better yet, if you can solve those old school problems in new ways, hey, what if you have a dungeon with multiple objectives, but Dungeon Finder, when you used it, gave you random objectives this time you go through the dungeon? Um, well, now all of a sudden your group is not doing the same dungeon every time. You know the rail that you might want to be on because you're incented it by these objective rewards. You've solved the problem of, you know, oh, nobody ever wants to do the optional stuff. And it's more elegant than just being like, okay, here's your freaking rail where, you know, go down the hallway and kill each set of trash one after the other. Um, and so. Personally, uh, my thought on that is that the um, uh, it's very easy to overstreamline. Um, it's very easy to do that, especially because there's just a difference when a game first launches and when that game is uh, eight or ten years mature. Um, and so, uh, uh, was there a specific I should answer? I, I like talking so much that I can uh, fall off the train. I, I, I think the nub yeah. of the question is identifying when enough streamlining is enough. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, and so my argument on that very specifically, and I talk to new designers and especially junior des designers about, all, about this all the time, and that is don't streamline the fun away. Um, let me give an example, the, uh, another example. Gray items, they're a pain in the butt, my bag's always full, oh, these stink. Well, it turns out if you remove items that you can just sell for coinage, your bags are empty all the time, you're never incented to go back to town, and it turns out just killing infinitely isn't quite as fun as a cycle like, you know, Diablo did this well, especially maybe some earlier Diablos too. Kill, 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 kill. Okay, you have this little mini game now to fill up your bags. Do you want to throw away the cheap stuff or just teleport back to town? Or, you know, it's, it's actually an interesting mini game, and it creates a break where it's not just all kill, kill, kill. In fact, one of the things we tune our areas based on is the fact that, you know, our early zones tend to be, hey, you, you know, it's action. You're landing on the planet. It's cool stuff. Go through the zone. Well, you know, the more that you incent just combat, 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 that can actually get drudgery. You want to have, oh, I've learned this area. Oh, I come back to this area, so now that I've unlocked some new things in it. Um, that's an example where you really can streamline away fun by trying to make it just all combat all the time. Now the, the cake needs a little cake as well as icing. It can't just be like a big bowl of icing in here. Have go nuts on it. Well, you can actually, and that's kind of yummy too, but that's a whole other ball of wax. Another question we have, um, possibly one of the last, is from uh, Fliff. Uh, a query as to the server types that mm. are going to be available. Uh, clearly people can make educated guesses based on norms, but we know you like to surprise people from time to time. Yes. Is there anything out there in that arena you could talk about? Sure, I'll talk about it a little bit, um, and I'll talk a little philosophy. Um, obviously PvP and uh, you know, Care Bear, or non-PvP, depending on your bias, uh, servers are kind of a must. Like, you know, some people just love it, some people just hate it. You, I think it's a switch that's necessary. Role-playing servers are interesting because the on the one hand, you really do want to flag for role players. Here's where you go where the best density of role players are. But it's also like setting up a big um, uh, a big flag for PvPers to come over and have a grand old time. Especially where you get role players who, well, they don't really care about the combat and all stuff. They want to RP. Um, are you creating this sort of a uh, uh, pit of despair now where all the, everybody else who wants to grief is going to come and because you're sort of flagging it for them to cause havoc. So that's something we actually look for feedback on and especially from the role playing communities because it's one of those sort of unsolved problems I think is what's the best way to flag and incent that stuff and even reward for it um, without causing havoc or attracting griefers. The, um, we have a couple ideas on different server types as well the, um, uh, but really we'll muck with it. We've made a system that allows us to add new server types regularly. I personally would be interested in things like temporary servers where you bring up something with a rule set, you test it out, and you see if it works, and if so, you know, move the servers over, add new servers around those kind of temp rule sets. There's some really interesting ideas actually tossing around on that arena. I don't know that we'll do it at launch, but post-launch, it's actually it's something I like to experiment with. Maybe in a future interview, I'll leak some of my thinking on the subject and create some uh, forum discussion on it to see if it's compelling or not.
Jeremy, I have to say it's been an absolute pleasure talking with you today. This is Ms. Per from MMOBuff.tv, signing out.